welcome to the council workshop for Monday, March 1st at seven o'clock. This meeting is to be held virtually, but steam, streamed live at dnb.org. Uh, council, we have a, a resolution to hold a public meeting without the public in, in attendance that was circulated with the agenda for the evening. Uh, is someone willing to move that motion? Councillor Curran, second by Councillor Bond. Call the question, all those in favor? Second. Yep. Contrary minded, motion carries. Uh, next up council, we have an agenda that's been uh, circulated for the meeting this evening. Are there any errors or omissions from the agenda as presented? Hearing none, will someone move adoption of the agenda? Councillor Black, second by Councillor Bond. Call the question, all those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Okay, council, we have uh, Oh, that's right. We do have uh, minutes that have been circulated from the February 1st Council Workshop. Uh, just want to uh, check and see, are there any errors or omissions from those uh, minutes as presented? Okay. Uh, I hearing none. Well, they are moved by Councillor Bond. Is there a seconder on the motion? Second by Councillor Back. Call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries and the minutes from the February 1st Council workshop are now adopted. The sole piece of business for tonight's meeting is the uh, financial plan deliberations. Uh, I just uh, have some introductory uh, comments to make, uh, hopefully that will help frame the workshop a little bit. Uh, the district's uh, approach to property taxes continues to compare well and for 2021 at 3%. It is currently one of the lowest in the region, which averages approximately 4%. Uh, and it is the lowest on the North Shore with the city at 3.98 and West Vancouver at 4.48. Uh, investments in municipal services and in particular infrastructure projects help sustain jobs and economy. And uh, the budget we are considering tonight reflects council's priorities and the many deliberations that have taken place over 2020 and 2021. It includes needed investments in mobility, housing, the economy, and climate emergency, along with critical investments in our infrastructure. Tonight, Mr. Daniluk will make a short presentation before we open to council's deliberations. Mr. Daniluk, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Little, and uh, good evening to members, to uh, members of council and the public that are watching uh, tonight. I'm pleased to be here tonight to present some key financial plan highlights, a summary of public input received during the process, and to support council through your financial plan deliberations meeting. Staff are seeking direction to prepare the financial plan bylaws based on the draft plan. These bylaws must be adopted prior to the tax distribution workshop in April. Just gonna switch over to the presentation here. Sorry about that. A few technical difficulties there. Um, as Mayor Little was indicating, investments included in the financial plan support uh, council's priorities while also making critical investments in public infrastructure. Like all municipalities, the district has made adjustments for the impacts of the pandemic and other costs rising ahead of inflation. Unlike other municipalities, the district's approach supports stable and competitive property taxes over the long term. This year, most property taxes in the region rise above the proposed 3% increase included in this budget. plan continues to turn the district's finances towards council's directions and the community vision with a responsible work plan focused on the needs of our residents and businesses and, the, and making the best use of taxpayers dollars. While this plan follows best practices and in many ways is leading, staff are mindful of the need to continue to improve the way service information and financial information are shared so we can continue to make it easier for the public to engage in the process 
And with so many important decisions to be made, this plan does focus at the policy level for council direction. Uh, the presentation will briefly cover these topics. Highlights included in the five-year plan are shown on pages four and five of the workbook under prioritizing investments in the community. Mobility investments include over $30 million in active transportation projects as we add walking and cycling connections between our centers, neighborhoods, parks, and neighboring municipalities. The plan also includes investments in road safety and capacity, along with provisions to attract new investments in transportation to the North Shore. A number of affordable housing projects were also included, along with provisions for additional projects and a new staff position supporting achieving the district's housing objectives, as recommended by the Housing Task Force. Child care spaces will be incorporated into the new Community Recreation Center in Lynn Creek and provisions for additional spaces are included as we uh, work through new direction from Council through the facility workshop in the spring. Safe safety, health and resiliency as well as investments in organizational resiliency are also included in the plan. Oops. In addition uh, to stable and competitive property taxes, the plan includes provisions to support the local economy within legislative restrictions and staff continue to advocate for a review of assessment practices and for municipal tax reform to address inequalities in the current system. A new department supporting our climate and environment plans is included as we aim to reduce community carbon emissions and energy use and make our communities more resilient to climate change by adapting our infrastructure. There are, are many more highlights in, in, in the workbook, so I encourage you to look at the, the pages on uh, four and five of the workbook for a little more detail. And with respect to the public input, uh, the public input received this year covered a variety of topics, mostly aligned with your priorities. The financial plan workbook was introduced to council and the public on February 8th. Staff received questions between February 9th and 22nd and met with the community associations on February 17th. The public also had an opportunity to provide their input directly to council on February 22nd. Staff prepared responses to questions received, which are attached in Appendix B of the report for Council's consideration tonight. We thank the public for their input and note there will be many more opportunities for input over the course of this year. As workshops are held on the targeted OCP review, on facilities, transportation, the climate emergency, as well as the district's finances. And as was mentioned during the public input process, we encourage the members of the public wanting to learn more about the finances to connect with uh, the finance staff at any time uh, during the process and, and throughout the year. In terms of next step, staff are recommending adoption of the financial plan bylaws on March 29th, so work can proceed on time sensitive projects. The tax distribution workshop will follow on April 19th where additional supports for business uh, can be considered. Opportunities for amendments to the plan are scheduled for the spring and fall. And the annual report will be released in June and will include a new schedule showing use of the COVID restart grant received from the province in 2020. And finally, workshops continue throughout the year as we, aim, as we work through options to bring our finances and services into balance over the long term as was discussed on January 25th at the long-term financial plan workshop. That uh, concludes the brief presentation highlighting um, council's priorities included in the budget and the process that we went through for public input. And I'm happy to answer any questions during your discussion. Thank you, Mr. Danilak. So tonight staff are seeking council's direction to prepare the 2021 to 2025 uh, financial plan bylaws based on the draft budget. And as, uh, as uh, was mentioned by Mr. Danilak, 
there are still other future opportunities to provide feedback on more specific items, including the tax distribution workshop, which is scheduled for April 19th. Uh, but uh, tonight is your, your first best opportunity to give feedback on, um, on, the, uh, on the plan. First speaker I have up is Councillor Hansen. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I'm pleased to move the uh, staff recommendation. Uh, I think tonight we're are we just we're just getting uh, uh, feedback on this. I think the wording is there wording you're referring to. No, perhaps not. I th I thought we were mm -hmm. uh, uh, there would be a motion to uh, proceed with the finalization of the plan. Uh, I'll double check that as we go through, but I'm pretty certain that tonight is uh, receiving feedback and then proceeding to a regular meeting of council for the next steps. Okay, well, thank you, Your Worship. The floor is uh, yours. Uh, start by thanking everyone uh, involved in developing the plan. And uh, in particular, I'd like to recognize the skill and expertise of all of those in the district who are responsible for this very important aspect of our planning. And I'd also like to thank all of the members of the community who provided input as to this financial plan, uh, the community associations and each of the individuals. And the, the comments have been useful. And it is obvious that some of the members of our community have dedicated significant effort to providing that feedback. And I thank those individuals for that effort. Now, budgets, of course, involve a balancing of interests. And on the one hand, the needs of our community are significant, and one can always point to areas where further investment is warranted. And I went through very carefully the written summary of uh, the feedback, and uh, one strand of the summary is to identify the areas where uh, matters uh, should be addressed that various community members feel are more urgent and uh, greater investment should be made. On the other hand, affordability always remains an issue for local government. Uh, local government taxation and especially utility charges are rising faster than inflation. And this has been true for decades. We must always be conscious of the need to keep local taxation affordable for those who live here. And of course, the, the other strand of uh, the commentary was talking about uh, tax rates and uh, the burden that tax rates impose on some members of our community. And uh, I can say that I believe that this financial pl plan broadly strikes the right balance. I support the 3% tax increase with the 1% being targeted to infrastructure and 2% uh, for inflationary operating costs. And I note that our tax increases compare favorably uh, to other jurisdictions across Metro. And that is uh, in no, no small measure, I believe, the good work of the uh, finance department. Now I am at the same time concerned about increases at Metro Vancouver for utilities with increases uh, projected to be in the double digits for each of the next five years for sewer and well in excess of inflation for both water and solid waste. I do compliment the district financial officers for mitigating these utility increases through advanced planning, but at 4.2%, uh, the combined utility rate increase is still well above inflation. One, one can always identify areas requiring investment. And I would encourage us to look at two priorities that I believe uh, could be increased in funding without changing our overall budgetary framework. And I start with active transportation uh, this plan calls for a $30 million investment over five years in cycling routes, sidewalk, and urban trails as part of a 10-year plan. Uh, I would suggest and ask my uh, council colleagues to reflect on the fact that given the importance of transportation as an overarching concern in our community, in combination with the fact that this is one aspect of our transportation plan that lies within our control and in which we can take more timely uh, efforts, I would encourage us to look at a greater investment in this area in order to speed up the completion of our network for active transportation. And I believe that this can be done uh, within our budgetary framework. I also identify just as another uh, area that struck me, community grants. 
Uh, this budget calls for 1.7 million in community grants in 2021. I believe that we could increase this number uh, given the dramatic needs in our community, social needs, and the relative cost effectiveness of these grants and the significant work done by nonprofits to whom these grants are awarded. And I have called and will continue to call for an increase in this budgetary item. In a budget of 327 million, I believe we can find a little room to give a little more to those who need it most. I look forward to the future discussions, as Mr. Danilek mentioned, uh, the opportunity for uh, further discussion of each of these and other specific budgetary items. I also look forward to future discussion on how we are to close the 200 million 10 year funding gap uh, so as to ensure that we remain on target for our goals for affordable housing and child care spaces. And I note uh, in the topic of affordable housing, I welcome the dedicated housing planner position, which was a recommendation of the Affordable Housing Task Force, and which I believe is a, an excellent step towards uh, recognizing the urgency of the affordable housing issue in our community. But overall, I approve of this financial plan. I thank all of those who participated in its preparation, and I look forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much for your feedback, uh, Councillor. And I will come back to you. Actually, the uh, a motion for receipt of the report tonight would be sufficient. So, if you would move that, I'll move a, a receipt of the report tonight. Thank you very much, Councillor. Is there a seconder for that motion? Councillor Back, Mr. Danilek. Um, I just, oops, I just wanted to point out that, that staff are seeking direction from council tonight to go away and prepare the financial plan bylaws uh, for adoption later uh, in March. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm just, re uh, page five, it says recommendation that this report be received for information. So it's in okay. your report. Is that uh, not sufficient? No, no. I mean, we're all going to give our feedback, but uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Back, uh, you were the seconder on the motion. Do you have comments prepared? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, I just, just a brief comment at this point. I think Councillor Hansen did uh, a fine job of uh, really cover covering some of the highlights of this financial plan. Um, and I agree with, uh, with the comments that he makes. I think uh, the tax increase of 3%, as he's mentioned, does compare favorably when we look at other municipalities in the region. So it's, I think, uh, I think it's, it's fair. Um, this financial plan, I think, also does a fine job of reflecting the priorities of this council in, in many of the different uh, key areas. Um, one of the highlights of the plan I wanted to touch on was the um, district's ongoing response to the pandemic as it relates to um, the economy. And I note that um, while we are limited um, with provincial legislation and how the district can support the businesses that are, that are recovering um, as we come out of the pandemic, that there will be some options for support that uh, are going to be addressed later in April at our property tax distribution workshop. So I think um, a lot of people will be, will be keen to hear some of those, those options. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it is a really good reflection of, of where, where we're at, the, the conversations that we've been having at the many workshops and, and council meetings throughout the year. And uh, some of the public input was a little bit interesting, um, but uh, that's, you know, just a reflection of, of our community and that uh, we have to continue, continually, you know, can, can engage on, on all of these topic areas and have these sorts of discussions with the community, whether it's affordable housing and active transportation. And, um, you know, we're not always going to get uh, everybody's support on, on these things. So I look forward to this, the, this, the discussion, but um, certainly at this point, I I'm, I'm look forward to supporting it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Back. Other members of Council? Okay, uh, I'll make some, oh, Councillor Curran. No, I'll go after you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, the five-year plan does uh, reflect uh, the priorities set about by this council, including the emphasis on active transportation priorities, uh, 
that we have set and obviously the creation of a new uh, department to focus on climate change and be able to bring climate change uh, perspectives to uh, the entire organization. And that definitely has been, uh, definitely reflects the priorities that were set about by the, by the council. Um, I also, uh, similar to Councillor Hansen, very concerned about the, uh, the other taxing authorities uh, that uh, uh, really are facing major capital uh, cost increases. Um, a lot of uh, the solid waste increases uh, and liquid waste increases are, are simply in part because uh, for many years, for generations actually, uh, we haven't been investing properly into that infrastructure. And so there's a catch up period. Uh, and if you want to uh, treat uh, your liquid waste to uh, an environmentally sustainable level, so tertiary is the new gold standard that we've been going to, uh, then there's a dramatic uh, capital cost. In the long run, there's actually uh, sort of more modest operational costs on uh, many of those technologies, but uh, uh, the capital costs on the front end are uh, are quite high, and uh, we're seeing that with uh, with the project on the North Shore and with the project at Northwest Langley uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant, and obviously the Big Kahuna region wide, which is the uh, the Iona plant in Vancouver, which uh, is uh, hopefully a, a new plant and completed plant will be uh, uh, is about ten years away, uh, which again these are very very long term capital projects, but they stay in service in that similar fashion for 60, 70, 80 years. And so uh, you, you got to build it and build it right with uh, the capital dollars at the front end. And uh, unfortunately, that is why the regional uh, percentages are very high and are projected to go up uh, quite a bit over the next bit. I don't sit on the water committee, but that's another one that is projected major revenue increases going up to about $420 million in revenue from from 300 and, uh, sorry, from 200 and, uh, 230. And uh, so it's a massive increase in the water revenues coming forward. And we still haven't addressed the issue of, uh, um, uh, we still haven't addressed the issue of, um, oh, oh, development paying for um, uh, cost charges for uh, uh, water infrastructure. And so uh, it's still your existing uh, municipal taxpayer that is paying to improve the system and extend the service, including the pipes and everything else, uh, to uh, new development in the community, rather than having new development paying for the extra burden that they present onto um, onto the system. And so that's still something uh, we have to work out regionally in order to be able to uh, actually have development pay for development as far as uh, uh, municipal infrastructure is concerned. Um, so. I, you know, I, I'm supportive of the plan. I, I always uh, am interested to see how the discussion goes with the community at the uh, uh, NB Can and uh, and talk. To, I have been talking to people after after that meeting. Uh, the response was positive. That people were glad that uh, this that the district staff took the time to meet uh, with the community associations, and uh, I'm glad that that went well. There are still lots of questions that have been coming out. Uh, specifically, I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Costa is, uh, uh, is signed up to speak a little later. I don't want to take any of his thunder, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the benchmarking from year after year after year, we, we still seem to be making some minor changes in the reporting process where we could very easily be making it so that our reports are, are uh, easy to compare from year to year. And uh, I, I don't know why we do that, but uh, it'd probably be best to... Um, basically set up a boilerplate of reporting and, and copy it from year to year wherever we reasonably practically can. I get that uh, something that we, we moved over to five-year planning for uh, for the finances and it changed how we report some things, but uh, uh, we want to make it as easy as we can for the community to be able to track the um, increases in, uh, in uh, both revenues and spending that are taking place at local government. Uh, I've got uh, some other comments, but uh, I may uh, space them out as the evening goes along. I've got Councillor Miri uh, up next to speak. Um, thank you, Mayor Little. Um, yes, your comments about Metro are, um, are uh, uh, welcomed. Um, I think the, uh, 
you know, the projects that are coming online for Metro are massive um, infrastructure projects to support the growth in the region. And, um, but they're very challenging as well. And you talked about the tertiary treatment at our Lionsgate facility. And I remember um, when I raised that, when I was first appointed to the board at Metro, um, and we were talking about the indicative design for the plant, um, you know, the, the, the thought arose that um, if we were going to be looking at the design, why not talk about tertiary? Um, instead of, you know, waiting um, for the, prevent or the federal government to turn around and require it, uh, why not do it um, now and uh, save us um, retrofitting that plant into the future? And um, working with the, uh, my fishy friends um, on the North Shore, uh, we were able to secure the support on the board um, uh, for that addition. But, you know, we talk about the cost of that and it's a, a $30 million um, bump in regards to the um, capital outlay of that project. And, um, but I had, you know, it's, it's amazing when you start talking about the numbers that Metro looks at, you know, $30 million to one of the, in, one, in regards to one of their projects is a rounding error. Um, you know, it's a, it's a relatively small amount of money when we're talking about a billion dollar project or $2 billion projects, or in the case of Axiona up in uh, uh, the Site C Dam, um, what is it right now? Six, $16 billion, um, something horrific like that. It's kind of frightening. Um, you know, and I think this pandemic has, you know, put us in a place where we really have to be, um, we really have to be so careful with the money that we spend. I mean, how can a how can a, a project um, that was you know once funded at eight billion dollars now doubled? Like that that just seems not even real. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, um, you know, these decisions that we're making, there's only one taxpayer at the end of the day. There's this, this money's only coming out of one pocket. Doesn't matter where it's going. It's just coming out of one pocket. Um, you spoke, Mary Little, about how, you know, this tax rate and Mr. Danilik has pointed it out as one of the lowest in the region. Um, and I applaud staff for bringing it in, um, you know, at, at this level. Although I do have a question. Last year, we went from 3%, which has been our norm for, for many years. Um, you know, we have to look after our operating. We have to look after um, inflation. We have to look after our capital. Um, but we did bring it down to 2% in 2020. Is there a reason that we didn't want to hold the line, given that we're in year two of this pandemic? We're not out of the woods yet. We were sort of in the same place we were last year. I'm just wondering why, um, especially given the, the um, you know, the money that's been given to us by the provincial government, it's really not exactly for us to decide what we want to do with it. We're not free to, I think Mayor Little and I were talking about some great ideas to help some, you know, local businesses and, you know, um, people that really needed support. And we're not allowed to do that because of the restrictions in re regards to, this grant, as, as much as I appreciate it, um, you know, I think we're the best ones to decide where the money should go. And I think we have a lot of people that are really struggling. Um, so I'm just wondering why we, we, we didn't want to hold the line this year at that 2%. That's question one. Mr. Danilak? Uh, yeah, so with respect to the, the COVID grant received from the province, it does have guidelines. So it's, it's applied to incremental costs related to the pandemic as well as uh, revenue losses related to the pandemic. Um, they do uh, have opportunities for that um, funding to be applied uh, for other uses like supporting vulnerable populations and uh, a few other items, but mainly it's, it's for um, covering municipal revenue losses and incremental costs related to the pa pandemic and restarting uh, our services with, with the community. Uh, with res respect to the 2% last year and 3% this year, um, like most municipalities in the region, there, there are costs that are rising a ahead of the 2%. Um, and so we've already made adjustments for those. Um, protective services are expected to rise uh, at 2.5%. And there's other costs in the plan, uh, especially construction costs when we look out um, into the future and the increased costs related to construction. It's, it's, it's about keeping up with our commitment to invest in public infrastructure. 
uh, last year there was a hold put on that um, and, and now we're catching up on that. So I would say that- the and, yet the and yet the construction industry, I understand, um, particularly in regards to some of our infrastructure projects, because there's so much uncertainty within the construction industry, then the, num the amounts on the tenders that are being um, uh, issued might come in actually less than what we thought. So, you know, I, I just look at, you know, we've got this 6.2 million that's come in from the province. We, 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 we knocked our, our uh, tax increase down to 2% last year. We're still in the middle of the pandemic. I guess, you know, in my simple way of looking at all of this, it seems to make sense to use that 6.2 million, um, you know, to address, um, you know, the issues that we um, can within the constraints of the requirements around that grant, um, but still hold it too, given that we're not really out of the woods yet. There was a story on the news tonight that the, um, in, uh, in Toronto, the commercial, um, lease um, availability um, uh, is uh, is so so bad. There's so many leases or empty units um, in the city of Toronto that um, landlords are giving one year free rent. They're giving one year free rent and improvements to the buildings, where once nonprofits had ten options, they now have thirty options to consider. Um, you know, in the next 12 months, we are obviously not as big as the market in Toronto, but that is going to hit us as well. And how is that going to change the dynamic of how we work? I still think we're in this very volatile place. And, um, you know, I don't know if it, a year is enough time to manage ourselves through this pandemic in regards to um, business as usual and, and getting back to normal. Um, I can come back, Mayor Little. If I have some several more comments, I think Mr. Stewart has a comment. Your Worship, just to respond to Councillor Mary, I mean, we're very sensitive to where the business community is right now, and we'll be discussing that at the tax distribution space. But the fact of the matter is, our costs are increasing more than two percent, and we can't afford to continue to defer uh, infrastructure uh, year after year after year. That's how municipalities get themselves into a situation where all of a sudden they need to have a 5% increase or a 6% increase in, in the tax rate. So uh, our experience with respect to uh, tenders, although some are coming in lower, many are coming in higher. And that reflects the fact that contractors are having a difficulty uh, uh, getting staff to work on the projects. Um, what we're seeing is most projects are actually extending way beyond uh, what the original timelines are. And in fact, the costs are therefore in increasing. So. Um, we think we're being very, very responsible. We're trying to balance uh, those respective uh, needs, but we would be very concerned if we go for a second year where we essentially say, no, we're not gonna be putting that money into the infrastructure. We know that's just deferring uh, projects and costs. Maybe we can have an app opportunity with staff to talk about the $6.2 million that we've received from the province and sort of get into a discussion about what that, what that money is gonna offset. Um, I think when it was first, um, uh, I, when, we, when we first understood that this money was going to be coming, again, I, you know, Mayor Little and I were talking about what, you know, what the money could be used for for the local community, and we really haven't had an opportunity to discuss what actually is the money going to be used for. So that would be something that I'd be interested in. I, I understand what you're saying, um, Mr. Stewart. I, I'm not sure if you were in West Van, but you, you may have missed the uh, zero percent increase. I think Mayor Little was. Councillor Little at the time, and we did the zero percent increase, and we spent many years trying to uh, trying to sort of bring ourselves back from that um, that decision. That I, I don't think uh, I'm not sure. Were you on council then? I, I wasn't, but they did it in West Van. I think in Dave's time as well. Oh yeah, no, it was a it was a, a bad move. I I never supported it, and uh, it came back to haunt us. So. Um, okay, so, and just, uh, you know, one more thing to add in regards to Metro Vancouver, um, they are actually um, working on preparing um, uh, DCCs, uh, um, increased DCCs for water at Metro Vancouver, and um, that is going to have a cumulative effect on, um, you know, all redevelopment in the region, because those cumulative 
um, DCC's additions are going to, again, impact that one taxpayer because it ultimately just gets passed on those costs, um, it, you know, to the market price of the unit. Um, so it's it it should have happened years ago. It didn't. It's going to happen now. Um, but again, it's just, you know, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. Um, which brings me, I guess, to um, some of the comments that we had in the addendum that was attached to the um, budget um, in preparation for tonight's discussion. And there was a number of letters that had been received. Um, and I'm not sure exactly if they were received through the budget input um, pipe. Some of them, I think, came directly to us. I was just wondering, I noticed that the letters that were coming in reg in regards to the costs of the decals for resident parking only up in Lynn Valley due to the um, Lynn Va Valley um, or the Canyon parking pilot, were those um, missed? Because there was quite a number of letters that I've received in regards to us charging. There was a letter that was sent out by engineering in regards to charging for the decals. And I'm just wondering if we missed those letters. Mr. Danilek, can you explain how letters got diverted into the package? Uh, was it because someone specifically had a budget question or because something may have had an impact on the budget? There, there is a, a channel, there's two channels. They, they either contact me directly, either phone or, or email, or they go through, uh, the budget email, and so all, all of the budget emails are, are included in, in the package. There were a couple other emails that were directed to us uh, from clerks that had budget impacts that we also included. It, it may be that we missed some others during, during the process. It didn't go through those channels. Okay. I think we've been talking a lot about, you know, sort of these little costs. And I know we have the discussion about the $10 pass for the park. And now there's the cost for the RPO up in the Canyon because of the parking program. And I'm, you know, it, it, the, the resident parking only program is a still, an, it can, it remains an unlevel playing field. Um, there's areas within the district that don't pay for decals for resident parking only, and then areas in the district that do pay and areas that, you know, may pay or, you know, um, in the future um, around the canyon. And I, I just, I just think we've really got to um, have a good discussion with ourselves and each other about, you know, um, reckoning with the fact that we pay some of the highest taxes in the region. We have some of the highest assessments in the region. We're, um, we're a community that is um, growing in its level of wealth. Um, but a lot of people that um, aren't wealthy, um, you know, still live here. They grew up here. They may be land rich, but they're cash poor. Um, I feel like I'm one of those people. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tough go. And the, the constant, you know, trying to recoup administrative costs, I, I understand um, the notion, um, but I'm just wondering, in scenarios like, for instance, Lynn Canyon, when we are implementing a pay parking pilot, um, we stand to bring in revenues upwards of half a million dollars a year. For the few passes that, um, you know, the decals that will be um, maybe considered within the community, is it that much for us to think maybe we could just cover the cost? Um, you know, when you pay eight grand in taxes every year, like, are those taxes not for things like this, lessening the impact of the, the world coming um, into the community? And, and we're certainly, as taxpayers, supporting, um, you know, visitors into our community with the work in our trails and, and the, the services and the, the areas that we offer for people. I'm just wondering... Um, if this sort of, and I don't want to call it nickel and diming because I think that's rude, um, but it's this sort of, you know, we're trying to account for every little penny. And I think sometimes that's what taxes, that's what taxes are meant to do. They're meant to, you know, deal with the services um, that are required to support a community and uh, support visitors that come into it. So I just, I just would like us to have a consideration of, of um, and certainly when the playing field is not level, I'm not sure how fair that is from one community to another. I'll stop there right now because I've talked a lot as I usually do, but I'm, I have some more things to say. So I'll, um, I'll just come back. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll save Mr. Daniluk from having to respond to part of that. I mean, those fees are set by council. And so uh, we had the discussion, council voted on the fee. And so it's, it's not left to staff to determine the rightness, the wrongness, the value of it. It's, it's, uh, it's set by the council and it's sent to, uh, to the finance department to figure out how to make it work. Oh, I, I understand that. I'm just sort of um, bringing it up as something that we might want to discuss. We did set the fee for the parking pass. Um, the resident parking only is, is set within a bylaw. Um, and it's certainly, um, you know, there may be interest on council to have a discussion about that. Um, I think when we go out to the community and say, we're going to do this parking pilot, so we take the pressure off of your neighborhoods and we're going to put these restrictions in your neighborhoods. And oh, by the way, you know, we, you're going to have to pay for a jekyll if you want to stop park on the road. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure um, how I feel about that if it's not a level playing field, which it currently is not. And I think until we get to a level playing field, I think we have to be really um, sensitive about that, given all the other costs that people are trying to absorb right now. And um, many of them have um, lost businesses, lost their jobs. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really, really tense time right now. Mr. Stewart? Uh, your, your Worship, we've had a number of discussions over the last decade on this whole issue of public good and whether things should be paid for through service fees or, or taxation. With the case of resident-only parking, Really, it's a scheme that benefits the residents in a particular area because it gives them um, a right to park and exclude others. And for that reason, we've, we've tended at least to try to cover our administration costs. But as you pointed out, council can always revisit that uh, if they wish. I don't know uh, what councillors Miri is talking about in terms of an uneven, uneven playing field. We tend to uh, administer the same costs for each of the resident only uh, parking areas. But uh, certainly we can we can revisit that. Oh, I just mean, Mr. Stewart, that yes, the cost is the same, except there's some areas that have have resident parking only that don't pay, and there's other areas that have resident parking that do pay. That's the only level playing field. Okay. Not 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 everyone's paying. Um, and um, so certainly we can revisit that, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kern. Thank you. Thanks, staff, for all your hard work. I'm like pen pals with Rick, just sending emails all the time. So thanks for all your um, answers to many questions that I had. Um, just a couple of thoughts and comments. I think it's important to um, speak in dollar values. So the um, 2021 budget reflects an overall property tax increase of 3%, and in, that is $71 um, on the average home. I did ask staff and I didn't hear back what we're using for an average because I know there's the census from 2016, but I'm not sure um, what did you were you able to get that? It doesn't matter, but if you have it. It, uh, it didn't come in. It came in late. That's okay. Um, the figure provided for the residential home price used there was uh, 1,328,000. Okay, so $71 for the 3%, so the 1%, um, the asset management is $24 a year, um, and then 2% is $47 for the um, operation. So um, I think it's important to put that in perspective of what that amount is. Um, I guess we could go through different sections. Transportation is the one that really stands out for me, um, and I... I'm trying to, and I know we are working towards a carbon budget, um, which is, I think, going to be important. This is halfway through a 10-year plan to reduce our emissions basically in half. Um, and so I'm not sure that the 30% spent on um, active transportation, it's our largest expense at $90 million in the five-year um, plan. So I would like to see more of that um, devoted to active transportation and to alternate modes of transportation. I understand the challenges oftentimes with TransLink and other things, but transit priority um, and um, other other creative ways that we could look at transportation um, that is within our things that we could do. So I do question that um, split. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm curious how um, 
we're going to get there. I know our OCP identified by 2030, 35% mode shift, but I don't think a 35% mode shift is going to line up with our SEEP targets. So I guess it's just kind of mapping the policies and frameworks all together and knitting them together and trying to figure out um, where we get, where we end up. But I think in five years, we're going to be like, okay, we have five years left. Did we, are we halfway there in terms of um, reducing our emissions? And I think it's really important when we talk about transportation to talk about um, you know, improvements in health and improvements in mental health and physical health and well-being um, in our community. It is the most, one of the most frequent um, complaints is sitting in traffic. So the question is, how do we get people um, to have a different, um, how can we support uh, our community to not live um, in traffic? And so I'd like to, I'd like to look, look at that number. Um, and when you look at cost recovery for transportation, it is our lowest at 7.3% um, versus planning and development, which has basically a 100 plus percent cost recovery. So um, I, I think it's just important to look at transportation differently um, because it is our highest emitter. And I think it, it creates a lot of mental, physical um, uh, challenges in our community and um, is is an industry overall, I sent to staff and um, the report that I found from Metro Vancouver 1993, which was their 30 year transportation plan. And so much of what they looked at doing to 2021, so I, it, was, it was ending here, was um, rethinking transportation. They're like, we're never gonna get to where we need to go if we don't um, properly pay, if we don't have um, properly cost this. And so, you know, it's deeply subsidized and it doesn't account for externalities and um, it's still our biggest expense. So I did want to flag that to staff. I don't know if you want to, or it's not really staff, it's council <laughs> speaking to if that's more of a, um, a priority, but I don't think we're there yet where we're aligning that with um, SEEP and I'm not sure how we get there, but that was one comment, I guess, on one series of comments on transportation in general. Um, I was pleased to see the 40 plus million um, for affordable housing. I think that's not well understood um, wh where we get that number, but I, I think that's just like something we can communicate um, out to folks differently. I'm very pleased to see the position because I think having a dedicated staff person to um, really push uh, that agenda is gonna be really important. And also being able to, um, you know, map uh, the policy when, when we get a funding opportunity, like there was just something announced today. And sometimes it's hard for staff to be able to, um, even though they do a great job, but it is hard to keep up with all of the changing um, funding streams that are coming through. So I think that staff position is gonna be really important because it is something that we are investing um, a lot into. And so we wanna make sure that we have staff um, support for that. And thanks to the task force for identifying that um, need. I think that's really important. Um, something else that I is is one of our biggest emitters that we don't talk a lot about is food. And I, when Ms., uh, Count, Mr. Hansen, Councillor Hansen, when you were talking about um, the community grants, I think that food security. Um, there's actually increasing food insecurity in our community, especially for um, uh, there was a, a program that helps with. Uh, food in schools, and they've noticed an increase in the amount of children in our community that are food insecure. Um, and food is is wasted. It's trucked. Our food waste is trucked to Pemberton. Like that system is completely flawed. And so um, I, I would love to see that. Um, we have table mat matters. We have some great community partners, but to see that be something that we invested more in. And I think community gardens um, are such a great way to connect people. Um, again, around that well-being lens of social um, and physical well-being, healthy food, access to healthy food, not wasting food, not trucking our waste to Pemberton. Um, so that's just something that I didn't really see sh show up in our budget. Um, and yeah, I, I still don't understand golf. Um, I, I'm still going to keep trying to understand um, the revenue versus the operating costs um, for that because it does show up in our budget in very in different ways and I don't think it's clear so I'd like to have a better understanding of each facility um, what the revenue it generates what it costs to operate um, what it what 
it pays the district for the land. Um, I think that's just a big piece that um, I don't ever understand where it shows up. So I'm gonna challenge staff to make me understand. Maybe it's a pretty graphic, I'm not sure, but some, somehow I don't understand the different um, pieces to that. So I think that's important. I'm just looking through some of the questions that um, answered. Yeah, I did flag on page 15, there were some um, questions about how are we going to raise revenue over time? And I flagged some concerns over the idea of privatizing public assets, but staff has assured me that that was not what was intended by that. Um, it was explore opportunities to improve return on investment for exclusive use of lands and facilities, um, and then alternate um, alternative revenue sources such as franchise fees, encroachments, and enhancing servicing, et cetera. Um, so just generally flagging um, that as a concern, but staff confirmed that that was not um, what was meant by that um, comment on page 15. And I'm just looking through my long list of questions that I handed over to you. Um, yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I'd like to hear what other folks have to say specifically around um, transportation um, and, and all the other sections and maybe we'll get another go. And I also did just want to thank Councillor Mary for getting tertiary because I think that that is such an important um, piece and it was not, that's not how it was planned. And so it's the right thing to do. So I'm actually really happy. And it is such a small amount. Again, when you look at the app, like what that cost is, it is a small amount um, and it's actually gonna save money when we look at things long-term. So I'm really glad that that is upgraded. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Curran. I'm gonna to go to Councillor Bond and Forbes as first time speakers, uh, Councillor Bond. Thanks, Mayor Little. I have a, a couple points, a couple comments on the budget so far. And uh, like Councillor Back, uh, I think Councillor Hanson Hanson provided a great overview of the budget and, and where we are, uh, as well as yourself, Mayor Little, at the, as your opening comments. Uh, one thing I think uh, that's important to highlight, and I try and do this every year, is um, you know I think the district for a long time has had a really sound financial foundation, and you know if you look at you know, page 17 of the workbook with the financial principles. I think those are financial principles that uh, we have had in place for a long time. Uh, and I think they've served us well. I think the, the, the slow and steady approach and the predictable approach to um, uh, service and tax increases over time uh, is um, probably goes unnoticed by uh, in our community but I think uh, uh, compared to other communities where you might have more uh, dramatic swings in in tax in, uh, increases I think uh, it's it's a it's a great program uh, also looking at the way that our staff um, project out um, shortfalls and increases in revenue and then um, try and smooth out the bumps along the way with uh, the use of uh, strategic reserves. Uh, I think that's uh, really important as well. Just uh, kind of highlighting the point of having a, a very predictable um, level of increase in our uh, costs and our uh, tax revenue to the residents of the district. So I think those are those are important. Um, the asset management, again, this has been a, a long, uh, a long going uh, program at the district and we still are considered leaders probably in North America of the way that we approach the, uh, the funding and the replacement of our existing infrastructure and our new infrastructure. And I, I think that's probably um, that 1% is probably going to be around uh, for a while because construction costs are continuing to rise at a rate far greater than 2%, uh, just materials and, and labor itself. But also uh, we do have a, uh, a spread out community uh, and that's an existing land use pattern that, uh, that was, that's been in place for you know, half a century. And maintaining all of that infrastructure in a, a good level of repair, all the hundreds of kilometers of roads and pipes for water and sewage is expensive. And uh, so I think that um, something where we've been playing catch up for a long time, but now uh, it's kind of at, uh, getting close to a steady state. So I think those um, those costs will continue to be uh, kind of around this steady state for a long time. Um, echoing, uh, I think the 
comments of uh, the rest of uh, members of council that have mentioned it around active and uh, you know I like to call it traditional transportation using your feet. Um, I, I think uh, I, I would echo those comments about front ending a lot of this investment. I think uh, the point that Councillor Kern made about uh, you know in five years from now uh, looking looking in and saying hey have we made our uh, emissions reduction targets have we uh, have we got half the way there I, I think if we're doing that in five years it's probably too late um, because it takes years for infrastructure projects to be um, implemented it takes years for things to be constructed so you know in five years we should already see that trend line going uh, we should probably have the infrastructure built that we need to see that shift in mode share and to see those safe and convenient routes for people to uh, walk and uh, bike around our community. So uh, I again would like to, uh, I think it's important in order to meet our climate goals, but also for the other reasons Councillor Curran mentioned about health and uh, community wellness and safety, uh, peace of mind uh, when uh, traveling around the community, um, moving a lot some of those investments up. So we do have that uh, connected uh, protected network of uh, facilities for people to move around our uh, community when they're not using their car. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, just another point on that, um, moving those uh, infrastructure investments uh, closer in time uh, instead of later in time also lets us reap the benefits of those earlier. And the cumulative benefit of that uh, over time is gonna be much greater if we do those investments and make those changes. Now, instead of five years from now, that's an additional five years uh, ahead of time where we're starting to reach those reach those benefits, uh, reap those benefits. Um, uh, another point I wanted to make is, uh, I don't know if it's been mentioned, maybe it's been mentioned a little bit, but um, you know, on parks and the outdoors, uh, I think during the pandemic, uh, we've seen so many of our residents uh, using uh, the outdoor, uh, you know, the natural environment in our uh, in our alpine areas and in our parks um, as, uh, as a safe way uh, to recreate, uh, to get out, to be healthy, to have those, uh, you know, those walking and talking kind of conversations since um, we're still in a, a place where we're not allowed to uh, or uh, recommended not to gather in other people's homes. So I think that's going to be uh, something that's going to be with us for, for a long time. Um, and I think people are coming to enjoy and understand the benefits of uh, being out on the trails or out in their local parks. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, we see the, um, the, the strategic plan for the Seymour Trail Network in the, in the budget for the next year. But I think uh, we're going to need, just because of the past year's uh, incredible increase of use, uh, I think we're going to need to pay a lot more focus uh, and probably spend some more money on on maintenance just to keep up with with that use. Um, and it's similar to uh, the other infrastructure and maintenance projects that we have. If we don't spend it now, um, while the use is happening and while the impacts on the different uh, park facilities and trail networks are happening, it, it's going to be a lot more effort to catch up in the future uh, due to those impacts and due to the increased use. So uh, I think. Uh, looking at those and planning uh, planning to invest in those in their maintenance, keeping them in good repair, and also expansion as we see more and more of our residents wanting to use um, the outdoors and wanting to use the trail networks uh, in new ways, you know, ways that they might have not used before. So um, you know, lots of people walking their dogs, lots of people going for hikes with their family, uh, lots more people riding bikes, lots of people uh, running, uh, running and hiking in our community. So I think those are uh, important. Um, also wanted to bring attention to, uh, again, on page 18 of the workbook, some of the new things that are happening uh, this year uh, in the budget. Um, I think it's been consistent for the past number of years that uh, staff are always looking for ways to uh, find cost savings. So there's, you know, uh, you know, half, is it about a half percent this year or 1% this year, uh, Rick, where we find, we staff have found cost savings over the, over the budget. Um, I think it says about $500,000 in the, in the workbook. Is that correct? That's about a half percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so it is important, you know, uh, as we try and optimize our operations to find those cost savings wherever we can. And that's a, an ongoing program that our staff are doing. Um, I think due to the um, slowdown in uh, approval of new apartments and townhomes, I think we're front ending about $2.2 million of revenue from uh, previous approvals into this budget to cover the uh, 
cover and stabilize the costs of uh, of planning uh, and uh, community planning. So uh, we'll see that. Uh, I would like to see how that um, how those costs will change over time. Um, should uh, should approvals and uh, and um, of new homes uh, remain lower for a significant amount of time? Um, because two point two million dollars is a significant significant uh, amount in our budget. I think that's about a that's about a two percent uh, a two percent um, on on the tax levy. Where should that be uh, a cost that has to go to the tax levy? Um, so I think overall uh, this is a it's another solid uh, budget and it builds on council's priorities and the uh, the work that we've done over the past uh, year and uh, you know front end some of that. Um, active transportation investment so we can meet the benefits sooner than later. Thank you, Councillor Bond. And definitely uh, people's behavior is being noted in the uh, usage of our parks and public spaces. And uh, it's certainly going to uh, uh, present us with uh, you know, impacts, including erosion and others that we're going to have to respond to with, again, investment in the community. But it's certainly something we see a lot of benefit back from. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Bond. Next up, I have Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I've got three pages of points here that I wanted to talk about, but I'm not going to raise them all. But one of my concerns, and I hope somebody can alleviate this concern, um, uh, and, and I, I want, first, I want to sorry for forgetting, for thanking staff and all the work that goes into doing budgets and trying to pull all the pieces together. It's not easy and I appreci appreciate them uh, doing all this work. And I also appreciate everybody who sent in from the public their thoughts and their concerns. Um, I think we had a little bit more public involvement this year than we have in the last couple of years. So it was nice to see that you know, there was more people getting involved. It wasn't just one or two people. So thank you to everybody who got involved. Um, one of my concerns is that I, I, like Councillor Mary said, I still feel that we're still in this um, pandemic, this COVID-19. And I don't think things are much better yet as far as people being, to get being able to get financially maybe back on their feet or find a job or full-time work or uh, above minimum wage work um, to get back to where they were. So I'm, I'm still quite concerned about the new capital expenditures and expenses that we have. I'm not saying that I don't agree with them. They do follow, most of them that I can see follow the council uh, uh, directive, but what when council gave their directive, which would have been in 2018, 19, beginning of 19, um, that we had no idea that something like COVID was coming around the corner. So I'm not differing with what our, our ambitions were and what our goals were. What I'm questioning is, are we still going at sort of a pre-COVID rate? And could we slow down some of this new, some of the new capital projects, uh, and maybe just service our core services and our core expenditures for one more year until we kind of figure out where we're going. So um, that's one concern I have that we we shouldn't be continuing. And I'm sure that there are things that have fallen by the wayside by staff, uh, and I mean that in a good way that staff has probably made the good judgment of which things they could let go or uh, weren't priority for at least the next year. Um, but I still think that maybe, maybe we could do a little bit more of cutting back on the new things. We still have to maintain what we already have, but the new things, maybe we could take a second look at and see if we can cut any, anything more out of the the budget, which consequently I would like to see the tax rate stay at 2%, like Council Murray was asking. Um, I understand I understand from the district's point of view of why we have to do certain things um, and the rules we have to follow under other provincial um, governments, but um, 
I still think, and I under, I also understand we're one of the better ones uh, as far as in comparison with other districts, but I'm not so concerned about comparing with other districts as I am trying to give the, the community members the best that we could possibly do. And if 3% is it, then 3% is it. But I was hoping we could have kept it for 2% for another year. So if we can somehow look at that, I mean, are our costs really going to dictate another 1% over and above in, inflation? I think as of the end of uh, 2020 was 08 so I just wondered if there's a little bit of wiggle room there that we could give uh, the tax of the citizens and the businesses a tax break. Um, also, I, I couldn't find it after I went back to find it here, but I noticed that when we're talking about some of council's plans, some of those plans are based on 2009 studies and older like that, 2009. Even the OCP is being updated for its very first time um, since 2011. So it's 10 years old and it was supposed to be updated every five years. So um, the OCP I, I know is a, a moving, uh, moving body and, and, and I agree with the OCP um, goals. I absolutely do. Um, but I'm just, some of the other focuses that are mentioned in this budget are based on previous, I assume, previous councils, because it's not something that I recall being brought up to us. So maybe council uh, could just take a look at some of these older plans and see if that's still where we want to go, or at least update them to where we are right now. Um, I was a bit disappointed, and I'm not quite sure I understand why we didn't have any COVID accounting in this break out exactly what COVID, how it affected uh, the organization and the, and the district and how the grant, what grants came in and how much they came in. I understand that uh, that's gonna come later, but I don't understand why it couldn't have come in this draft. I've noticed several other municipalities have laid it out explicitly the money they received and where they spent it. And so I would have really liked a comparison in here with 2020 showing COVID uh, effects on the district. Um, I also wondered, we don't have minimum and maximum limits on reserve accounts and yet on page eight, it says we do. Um, so I just wondered if somebody could answer that if if I'm mistaken, and we do have those minimum and maximum amounts, because um, I don't think we do. And if we don't, we should have bylaws in place to put that in place. Um, Mr. Danilo, can you respond to that? Uh, yes, I can. The reserve funds bylaw, which was adopted last year by council, simply um, establishes the funds and the purpose. Uh, there, there has been discussion for minimums and maximums on the reserves uh, at, at finance and audit. And we, we do set existing uh, asset reserves uh, to levels in order to sustain those assets in a state of good repair. And when it comes to uh, reserves supporting new investments, uh, we're targeting ongoing funding there and one-time funding there to support uh, council's tenure plan. Um, so we will we will be bringing back a, a reserve fund policy which speaks to the minimums and maximums that you see in the budget workbook to finance and audit. Good, good, thank you. Um, uh, just a couple more and then I'll give someone else a turn. Um, Sustainability. Um, I wondered about this year, a few years ago, but with CACs going down and we're doing more and more, thank goodness we're doing more and more social supportive housing, affordable housing. So often we don't get any DCCs, we don't charge DCCs, or we don't charge uh, building permit fees. Um, so that consequently has caused our reserves to be drawn down as far as I can see if I read the financials correctly. So um, how do we get 
more revenue to cover operating and capital costs without relying as heavily as we do on property taxes, like 70 or 79, it's over 70% we rely on property taxes. And so I'm concerned about I know there's mention of franchises and encroachment and that, but I think we really, really need to put our all our heads together and try and deal with this ASAP because I don't, I don't foresee this what I've just mentioned uh, changing in the near near future. But I do worry about the reserves being drawn down all the time, um, and I do want us to stay in the support of uh, uh, social housing and affordable housing. I do want us to stay in that. So that means we are, besides giving land, we're giving up those CACs and BCCs and BPs. So I'm I'm just concerned. Have you got any, can you address that at all, Rick, or? Uh, I, I can respond. Yeah. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, managing growth and growth related projects, and there's definitely a connection there with, with one-time revenue through development. Those, if there's a timing issue in the collection of funds, we, we could look at uh, bridge financing, but generally those projects would not proceed without those uh, funds made available. And if, if you look at the financial plan in the broader context, um, the existing ratepayer is through the policy framework largely insulated from the impacts of investments in new capital and growth. That's the intention is that they, they're not impacted uh, by these new things that we would like to invest in, but they do benefit from them. So you're, what you're saying is our reserves are supposed to be used to protect the taxpayer? When, when it comes to um, the existing rate payer, um, the uh, reserve funds that we have set up just to, to look after the assets that we already own, obviously okay. they're, they're paying into those funds. Uh, but when it comes to the new investments that we want to make, th those investments are largely funded um, by other means. And uh, that's the case in, in most of the new capital that you see invested in this plan. And what would just an example of other means be? Uh, well, um, we, we have uh, external uh, sources like senior, level, senior levels of government, um, we have, as you've mentioned, uh, developer contributions. Um, we also have um, growth in, in um, some of the neighborhoods that's occurring and through council direction, we're taking that growth in revenue and moving forward with investments in active transportation. If prior to that direction, um, there was no uh, ongoing source of revenue to expand our active transportation network. So we, we were very much focused on insulating the existing rate payer from these new investments and, and uh, finding new ways uh, to make these needed investments uh, move forward, needed new investments move forward. Uh, when it comes to the alternative revenue sources, diversifying, diversifying our, our revenue sources is, is important and, and that's one means why, where, where you could uh, explore minimizing impacts on the existing rate payer as we look after all of our existing assets. That's something that we could look at for sure. Just one more thing and then I'll break um, for someone else. I, just because you've mentioned it, the asset things, that was something else that I was disappointed that wasn't included in here. And I'm just wondering if, if it's something that you have planned to have uh, for the final um, financial plan. And that's a listing of the assets, the conditions are in. and. So we could get an idea of, uh, um, just get an idea of what the turnover every year is for asset maintenance or, or asset purchase or renewal. Uh, we, we are planning on including an update um, on, our, on our assets in a finance workshop later, later this year. So there's a workshop series start, mm -hmm. starting with the OCP, the targeted OCP review, uh, then facilities, transportation, climate, and then finally um, finances. And that that, that uh, workshop will, will look at options for um, bringing the services and plans into balance and we can provide updates on, on our, our assets at that time as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Danilak. Sorry, Mr. Stewart. 
Your Worship, I just want to remind Council, this is a, a rolling five-year plan. So you're really only committing yourselves to this year. And as we continue to work through the long-term financial plan, and that's why we introduced it this year, so that we could have a really robust conversation with, with the Council and perhaps even the public on the philosophical and structural underpinnings of how we afford and address uh, changes, and in, including that whole issue of um, you know, the public good and why do we charge a fee for this as opposed to pay for it for taxes with that and how does that fit into development, pays for development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're hoping to have a number of workshops with council uh, this year to delve into that uh, as we prepare for a 2022 financial plan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I've got uh, first time councillor back. Thank you. It's my second time actually, but it's, it was uh, early on that I made a comment. So I just wanted to make a quick comment um, to you, Rick, around uh, childcare, which is something that I didn't address in my previous comment. But um, one of our priorities as a council is to implement the child care strategy and action plan. And I noticed there's nothing in the 2021 um, budget, but I wonder if you could comment on the years after that and if we feel that we've got the, the right amount of funds in there to uh, implement that plan. Daniel? Sorry about that, I was on mute. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, right now what the, the plan is reflecting is is the uh, spaces included in, in the Lynn Creek Community Centre and future provisions in the other centres, but as was pointed out in, in the Child Care Action Plan, um, there is a call for further investments. And uh, that the topic of that that conversation will be brought up at the facilities workshop later this spring as we explore our existing uh, investments in facilities, how they support childcare, and op options for uh, introducing new childcare spaces in some of our facilities that are being upgraded and uh, replaced. So there definitely will be opportunities for further amendment to the plan. Great. It's, uh, we have that flexibility. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Murray. Um, thank you, Mayor Little. Um, I, uh, sorry, I'm just messing with my volume. Um, just, uh, just on that child care, I, I just uh, want to make sure that we're also, we talk about further investments for space, but um, one of the integral parts of child care is the investment in people um, and those that are trained to actually operate those child care uh, spaces and there is currently my understanding is there's currently a, a shortage of um, of skilled workers um, to fill those spots um, and part of the problem is the rate of pay um, and uh, I know that the um, uh, the STAs um, within the school district um, they're being hired right out of their program uh, in in many cases um, they are hired before they even graduate because there's such a uh, there's such a need for them throughout the region as um, you know the region grows and and you know certainly out in Surrey one of the you know the largest school district in the region and uh, they just can't get enough people to fill the spaces so it's it's great that we want to put aside physical space but you need to actually um, be able to operate it um, with employees and there's a high ratio certainly when they're you know um, children the age of counselor backs um, little one um, you know it becomes a lot more um, so I think that's a really important piece that we need to to uh, talk about um, just a couple of things I just wanted to ask about the um, active transportation and the prioritizing of the high impact cycling routes and the connections, the gaps that we still need to fill. Um, where are we in regards to prioritizing those uh, gaps? Um, I remember when we were talking about um, 29th, but we were talking about what was happening in the town centers and what was going on with the um, mountain highway interchange you know, do we, are we going to be able to fill all the gaps along the low level, say from, I mean, I'm not gonna say Deep Cove along the Dollar Ten because there's some significant challenges there, obviously. 
and Mayor Little and I still have to go walk around those areas that they want to move the spirit trail in because we have some concerns about that. But certainly from Maplewood to uh, Park Royal and the pieces that we own, um, where is our prioritization in regards to that? Because I think that would, you know, um, that would uh, collectively um, work for a lot of people. Yep, Mr. Danilak. Mr. Danilak? I'll answer uh, what, I, what I can. There was a prioritized um, list of cycling improvements that was presented to council last November. And I know there's an update scheduled through a workshop on transportation a little earlier this year. Oh, yeah. Good. And uh, so that discussion can happen there. And I believe uh, Mr. Joyce is also listening in if he has more to add. I, I would just say um, that, you know, it might make more sense um, for us to front end some of this instead of waiting for um, and maybe we're already going to do that. I have to be reminded as to where we are in these projects. You guys do this all day and it's not something that I'm necessarily um, watching all the time, but I would hope that we're going to, um, given, you know, the situation with development right now, who knows how it's all going to fold and uh, unfold, but, um, you know, maybe we do need to look at front ending some of those gaps to sort of complete that low level connection. Um, if that seems appropriate, um, rather than waiting, um, because it, it is challenging for those and certainly the, the interchange improvements, they're going to be, bring, bring great improvements to walkability and, and cycling and better connections. Um, they already have, um, but it's when you finish that great connection and then, and then what, um, you know, so I, I look forward to that discussion. Now on that, um, uh, I just wanted to, um, we talked about um, DCCs for Metro. Um, one of the other um, items that was approved last year was a $4 million yearly tax requisition in regards to land acquisition for Metro Vancouver Parks. And um, tertiary and parks were the two things that were um, the big discussions um, of Metro last year and adding these amounts. I think it's $4 uh, um, on the tax levy um, for parks, seven for the tertiary, I believe, um, if I recall. And that those park acquisitions are critical because we were blessed with such a, um, a, a wild um, region. Um, and yet, as we increase our population, and certainly with COVID, what we've experienced in the last year has been this um, massive um, influx of people coming into our natural areas. And so um, this $4 million um, yearly um, is going to go towards those um, strategic land purchases to expand our parks, um, our, our regional park system, so we can spread out the love um, that people have for the outdoors. Um, you know, you think of Boundary Bay as very vast, a very sort of vast area. It is under siege uh, with the amount of people going into Boundary Bay on a daily basis in the summer. And certainly um, through the pandemic, we had a um, unprecedented um, increase into our park system in 10 months. I think it was 16.5 million was the final count um, last year. And uh, we had reached about 10 million the prior year. So it was a huge influx of people. And there's a massive significant impact to those areas as, as well. Um, the, an environmental impact and um, a management impact. Um, Metro Vancouver is also looking at their asset management plan. Um, and that's going to be, you know, there, there's gonna be a cost there as well um, because it's a big system. Um, but in regards to how I think we need to move forward with our um, uh, regional park system or our municipal park system is we do need to, I think, simultaneously look at um, a management plan. And I have, um, I have uh, um, uh, requested through Metro Vancouver Parks, Mr. Joyce, he's spoken about this a number of times, um, we're, we've created sort of a, um, a management body of provincial park representatives, although we only have one planner 
on the entire South Coast for the provincial government. Um, we're working with our planners in planning and parks at Metro Vancouver, um, Mr. Joyce's team here in the district and um, the district of West Vancouver as well to have a management um, plan across the North Shore. Um, again, we have to spread out um, the love of these areas. And uh, I think we all need to be on the same page. That would be um, probably the best um, direction to go in. Um, so the management plan is one thing. And then the ability to address the impact um, on our trail system. And when I was elected in 1996, we were behind in regards to the monies. And Mr. Joyce has the largest budget in the district. And we were behind in 1996 in regards to work on our trails. Um, the costs of, the, uh, of, of repairing these areas is massive. Um, we are helicoptering in, um, you know, equipment and machines. Um, it's very labor intensive work. So I think that we really need to focus knowing what we know now that all the people that were told by Dr. Henry to go outside and experience this place called outside are now going to stay outside because they like it. They think it's a good place to be. Um, and I think that we need to shift some resources prioritize resources to our parks department to a, um, you know, really um, seriously look at um, a, a North Shore perspective with our uh, neighboring municipalities and um, uh, neighboring landowners in regards to how we're going to manage all of this, um, but also put the money into um, making sure that the environmental impact is not going to get us to a point of no return. Um, I know that staff, you know, are looking at decommissioning some trails, looking at um, opening up other ones. There has to be a management to it, as well as um, communicating with our three um, mountain operators. Um, you know, there is a business case to be had in regards to what opportunities exist for um, Cypress, Grouse, and Seymour. Um, and, and certainly I think that, you know, um, those business cases could, uh, you know, encourage them to look at, you know, opportunities, um, that, you know, they may not, uh, that, that don't exist right now that would take some of the pressure off. Metro Vancouver is doing that through their park system. They're trying to, with these land acquisitions, we are trying to take the pressure off of these other very well-used areas. And we have some of the best, um, Grouse Mountain, um, Quarry Rock, uh, Lynn Headwaters, the Canyon, um, you know, uh, Honey's Donuts. Um, we have a lot of the, um, the greatest tourism um, destinations in the region, um, in the province. Um, but there, there's a cost to looking after them. There's a cost to the impact. And I think we really have to start um, putting our heads down and, and looking at how we're going to finance this going into the future. And to end, I will say that we have the best finance team in the region. Um, Mr. Wardell, um, Mr. Danilek, um, Mr. Um, Iorio are um, leading the discussion um, in regards to um, um, finance reform in the region, something that absolutely need, needs to happen. Um, they have um, connections throughout the region who they talk regularly to. Um, we are very well served and have been very well served for years and years by our, our uh, finance uh, team. And um, I do have great trust, doesn't mean I'm not going to criticize and I'm not going to bring up my points and say that I want to do this instead of that. Um, it would be boring if I didn't do that, Mr. Danilek, Mr. Wardell, um, Mr. Yorio. Uh, so, um, I thank you for all this work. Um, it gets more complicated. I have to tell you, it's not getting easier. It was easier. Um, and I, I look forward to Mr. Iorio coming and speaking to us um, uh, uh, um, uh, because I think I understand him better than I understand Mr. Danilek and Mr. Wardell. So I look forward to him being at one of these meetings. There you thank go. you.
Well, you made Mr. Danilet blush, but then I think you took care of that on that last well, one. Well, I have to sit down <laughs> with him for a few hours to get him to speak my language. Um, yes. Nicole had it down pat. You guys need a bit of work. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Councillor Bond. Thanks, Mayor I think um, I'm going to go back. I think Councillor Forbes brought up a great point um, that I wanted to go through. And I think it's probably um, speaking to Mr. Stewart's point about that greater discussion about um, some of the principles. Um, uh, it's always good, uh, at least for me, <laughs> uh, to go through some of the some of the key concepts um, that we that we have in our financial plan. And I think it was about um, the uh, the the new the, the reserve for for the growth reserve so the new tax revenue reserve and then a point that you made mr Danlock about um growth outside of centers and i just wanted to confirm my understanding of those is that um for the for the tax growth reserve obviously through our policy of uh, of you know um people that purchase or rent uh, new homes in our district a new uh, apartments or townhomes uh, pay uh, a capital cost um, to facilitate the new uh, facilities and new um, you know community centers or plazas or other things uh, that go into those town centers as well as a um, another capital cost to um, pay for the incremental impacts on infrastructure such as the water and the sewer utilities and those are the CACs and the DCCs so um, new purchasers, uh, new renters in those uh, town centers, in those apartments and uh, townhomes uh, contribute a capital cost. And that's done uh, when uh, those buildings are constructed. Um, now, the tax growth reserve is that um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying this because I want to confirm my understanding because I think it's important, um, is that uh, those new homes obviously have a, a net uh, value in a tax value, an annual tax bill. Uh, over um, you know the previous number of homes, and as we have it right now, um, a significant portion of that uh, annual tax growth is directed into a reserve because um, just because a, a per person purchases a new home or moves into a town center doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that the operational impact and there's additional operational costs at this point in time but there will likely be into the future. So um, staff are stabilizing that operational um, cost by putting that money into reserve so that when those costs do happen, we've been saving up over time to, again, like you said, insulate the impact on um, people that uh, have, have existing homes in the, in the district. Is that, is that my correct understanding of that tax growth reserve? Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, okay. well, that's that's good. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, I've got one more question. So if you want to just hold on for a second, then when you mentioned the tax growth outside of centers, uh, I, I'm assuming that you mean that if someone uh, owns an existing single detached house that's worth one and a half million dollars and that gets torn down and replaced with a three million dollar house, obviously that three million dollar house now pays more tax. And, and what staff have been doing based on council direction is taking that additional revenue and putting it in a reserve to reinvest back into those uh, those areas outside of centers because it's not technically it's not new development uh, but it is a tax growth and that's where we're starting to fund our connections between the town centers and those other uh, new capital uh, projects that were uh, that are in the financial plan is that is that correct as well yes that's correct Okay, that, 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 that's great. I think it's it's important because it is an important financial principle that we have in terms of, um, you know, um, purchasers of new homes, but also, <laughs> you know, builders of, of new homes when you're building a, a additional value that that, uh, that the costs of all these additional um, capital plans are, are not going on back uh, onto an existing taxpayer. It's, it's the new growth that, and I think that's, uh, it's been a financial principle in the district for a long time and uh, seems to be serving us uh, well so far. So I uh, appreciate my uh, confirming that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Bond. Uh, next up, I have Councillor Curran. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bond. Now I know more than I knew about that. So 
Um, appreciate that. I um, wanted to talk, put on my planetary health hat for a second because we um, talk about um, human health being completely connected to a healthy planet. And I think as everyone's mentioned, COVID has shown um, how much that important connection is to nature. Um, and so I did want to, and, and the fact that the district has been leading, so high five to everyone in finance, but we're gonna like, our high five is gonna get even better once we add those carbon budgeting and na nature-based uh, or uh, natural asset management. Um, and we're gonna be the first in the world to do this, which is super cool. Um, right, Rick? He's just laughing because he's like, yes, it's going to be so cool. Um, but could staff speak to, because we don't, in a typical financial budget, um, the thing that is probably most valuable to all of us, which is nature, is not accounted for um, at all. So when we make decisions, we're not um, accounting for the benefits that nature provides to us, whether that's flooding mitigation, whether that's health, happiness, well-being. Um, and so it's kind of a new way of looking at um, economics, I guess, um, centered in nature. And it's something that other municipalities, we know West Vancouver, and I know our staff has met with uh, West Vancouver staff to talk about that. Um, will this be our last financial plan without the nature or the uh, natural asset management component? Can I get a guarantee? No, um, but I know staff's working on it. So could you please update um, about where that work is. Uh, it looked like uh, Mr. Stewart wanted to comment on this work. Yeah, your, your Worship, we're well aware of, of both those issues and uh, we're gonna have to have some uh, workshop or other workshops with council just to define what that actually looks like. But we're certainly striving to head into the next budget with that, those, those philosophies, those ideas taking, in, taking into account. But we do have to have more discussion with council so we're all, really on the same page in terms of what that means and what the impact is. Sound, sounds good. Yeah, it's, a, it's an emergent field, but I think as leaders, it just makes sense for us to keep leading um, on that. So I'm excited about that work um, this year. And then, yeah, I just wanted to echo what everyone was saying about parks. Um, and that could really tie in nicely to some of these discussions around zero waste um, because the impacts on our parks um, in terms of dog waste and and human single-use plastics and all of that thing. So I think there's ways to connect some of the other initiatives we have to do through parks. Um, and that obviously is going to cost um, some money to do that, but also um, be good for the environment. And it's something that our community is so passionate about, um, reducing single-use plastics. I know with COVID, we've seen obviously an increase, um, but there is starting to be more talk in that space. And so that is something that we will have to invest in. And I think all of that really ties back to communications, which is there was a study, um, I think it was maybe an article that I read where our communications staff is awesome. This isn't a criticism at all. It's just very lean um, in comparison to some other municipalities. And I think communications, especially in this time of a pandemic in with like growing division, with misinformation, it's so important for us to communicate, especially some of these really big initiatives that we're doing um, and um, be able to have that be both ways, like good ways to listen to um, folks and then good ways to um, communicate out some of the initiatives that we're doing around heat pumps and, and all of these other things. So I know communications um, is usually in, shows doesn't show up um, on its own in this, but I just wanted to talk about how important um, communications is to um, a lot of the work that we need to do, really letting people understand what we're doing. And I think with financing, there's some really cool new tools that I, I know um, Rick's been playing around with, which are awesome, that just make graphs and things that make it really easy to see at a glance, like where your money goes um, in the municipality and does it align with the values that you see, um, even budgets that uh, residents can engage with and say, what would you do if you were in council seat? Like, what, how would you, what would you prioritize? Which I think are um, really interesting. And um, yeah, no, I, that's the, the natural asset was the big one and parks. So those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Mr. Danilo. I just had one follow-up comment and um, wanted to acknowledge that we've been using business case, business casing for decision-making for a, a number of years now. 
um, supported by Mr. Stewart a long time ago. And um, when we do our business casing, we do look at things from a triple bottom line perspective, socially, environmentally, and economically. Um, but the, the things that you've mentioned about beginning to value the natural environment and and other non-financial things, we've not yet attached a price to it. So that that's something uh, that we could, we are definitely looking forward to um, moving moving into and, and uh, improving the way we communicate about these things and how we make those decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, we certainly have had a long track record of, of protecting the natural environment in our area, regardless of whether we're accounting for it in the budget or not, but um, uh, it, it's certainly been a priority. It's one of the big uh, major uh, identifying features of our community is our relation, close relationship to nature in this area. But uh, it's good to codify the value in our in our budgets as well so that people can see uh, how um, that protection is uh, definitely worthwhile and helps us in our budgeting process. Uh, I just wanted to remind council of the time. We have 20 minutes uh, till the scheduled end of the time, but I do have uh, two members of the public that are signed up to speak and I'd like to be able to get them in. So I've got Councillor Hansen, and then if there's no further questions from Council, then I'm going to go over to the uh, representatives from the public to speak. Uh, so go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. And I do look forward to uh, the input from the public. I'm going to uh, move the conversation uh, to a totally different direction, which is uh, the computing strategy of the district. And on page five, uh, there's discussion of ongoing investments in the dig district's digital transformation, creating opportunities for residents to quickly, easily, and securely complete transactions and services and so forth. I, I, I think this uh, is broadly a discussion of the website. And in the budget item, there's $2.3 million to be spent in 2021 in one way or another on our uh, uh, computing of which 750,000 is the digital transformation. And I just raise this in the context of the fact that there are people in the district who uh, believe that we have not done a particularly good job of uh, creating digital access and that uh, the website in fact remains uh, challenging for some to use, is not as user friendly as it could be and uh, I, I just, I, I suppose I uh, make the request that we as council learn a little bit more about how this $750,000 uh, is being spent uh, to ensure that in fact, uh, we end up uh, making it better instead of worse. Because in my experience, there's been changes to the website that have actually uh, cost money and actually left us with the worst website. Uh, that was some time back, but it's something that can happen in the world of computing and digitalization. So. Uh, not so much a budget uh, comment, except uh, to say that if we're going to spend the money, let's make sure that we get uh, some results for that. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Hanson. Uh, Mr. Stewart? Well, I'm just going to mention, we should, we'll provide an information report. We have really uh, committed to making a departure from the sort of traditional IT model into something that's digital, and we have a, work, a very aggressive work plan for 2021 and 2022, and we'll share that with Council. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Councillor Forbes. Thank you. Just a couple things. Um, I just wanted to mention I was stunned at the cost of turf fields. Um, like the Argyle turf field, we've spent 55,000 already, but it's another 3,500,000. I wondered what's the life of the average turf field? Can anybody tell me? Just for that kind of cost, what kind of uh, lifespan do we get? Mr. Joyce. Oh. Hello, Council. Um, Councillor Forbes. Um, the turf itself, 15 to 18 years, but the field, the substructure, indefinite. Um, a lot of the cost is to build the substructure, which is granular material. Um, right. If you're looking at Inter River, there's preloading that has to occur there because of the settlement that's really not that cost and the materials that have to be trucked in. Um, I think council is well aware with the school fields, the, the school will bring up to a gravel standard and council has, has looked carefully at uh, our artificial plan and has agreed to place artificial fields on school sites. And, and so that's what we're taking over and providing that uh, 
artificial field of, with the corresponding increase in hours that we get played on there. But yes, indeed, uh, artificial fields are inspected. But you get much more on, on playable surface through uh, uh, the rainy seasons here in the North Shore. Oh, I, I, I know if Kirkstone make a difference on your... Oh, well, the Kirkstone was 400 hours when it was that old field. Yep. And for less than a million grand, it's been a tremendous improvement on playable hours. So well worth the money on that one. Absolutely. 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 I agree with you. But now that something was mentioned, that leads me kind of into another question. I just raised this as a question if we're going to, if this is something council is going to be looking at sometime this year, I hope, or... If there's any uh, any discussion about it, um, we do cost sharing with the city, and I don't know how often that's looked at. And I'm a bit concerned that when Harry Jerome um, shuts down for three years, we're going to have massive use, especially at Delbrook, <laughs> but we will have massive use of our facilities. And so I'm wondering how often we look at that cost sharing um, between the two municipalities and would we be open to um, maybe having a temporary uh, temporary change because of something like that where there's going to be a three-year drain on on the recreational facilities in the district? Uh, and Mr. Stewart may want to comment to this as well but through your worship each municipality is responsible for the capital costs of the facilities, but there is a very clear working relationship with city staff, the district staff, and I'll say the rec commission who book these fields. So sort of a tri, tri grouping that looks at all the fields for both the city and the district, including what fields are to be built next and what the demand and supply is. That's not done in isolation by the municipalities, but is looked at between both. But each municipality pays for the capital costs of the fields and then bookings are done through the rec commission. I'm actually referring to actually rec sectors right now. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, yeah, and, and now we also uh, did have uh, the Delbrook pool shut down for a long period of time and the city did pick up uh, some of that as well. But mm -hmm. do you have a comment? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, looking at shared services and, and costing formulas, I swear has been the bane of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done it forever. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, uh, we, we did manage to make adjustments to the RCMP contract because we uh, were experiencing uh, more utilization of the, the members uh, in the city than, than the formula uh, uh, registered. And uh, so that was successful. I expect that we're going to enter into a discussion on recreation as a result of adding Lionsgate and, and the upgrading mm -hmm. of Mary Jerome. So uh, that recently came to council for some direction. It's going to the city in the next month or so, and I expect uh, they're going to support uh, some discussions on where we're going uh, forward uh, with, with respect to that. Uh, it will be interesting to see um, what museum and archives looks like two years from now, once that building is actually put in place. So I expect we're going to have lots of good conversations with the city <laughs> in particular on cost sharing. Okay, thank you. And then it just on my wish list, a couple of things that I think would make it easier for everybody um, is if we could do more of the graph type thing, the visual, rather than just all the numbers, because some people can take in the visual easier sometimes. Um, and maybe a staff, I noticed, I don't know if it was Burnaby or Surrey, but they have an organizational chart. And then under the organizational chart, they just put the number of staff in that department. And that might answer some of the public's questions about how much staff we have, that kind of thing. Um, and the last thing was I'd spoken to Rick about, I'm hoping maybe some of the um, IT or digital type work that's gonna happen I'm, is gonna allow for this. Uh, Rick said he thought it was coming in the future. I hope it's coming in the soon future that um, if the, the budgets, if we can have some sort of a drill down capability that would drill down as far as one or two more levels that the public might be interested in, um, that wouldn't cause us, just publish it on the web, but it allows you to click on it and go down maybe one level or two levels to get public questions answered, not the full drill down uh, right to the nuts and bolts of things. But if we could enhance something like that, 
it would cut down on the hopefully it would cut down on a lot of phone calls back and forth which it's good to talk to everybody but um i just think it would answer a lot of the public's questions that's it that's just my wish list thank you councillor forbes okay moving on to uh members of the public that had signed up to speak I, again i've got uh, uh corey cost followed by cooper quinn and uh dr cost Got a few minutes to address the workshop. Well, I hope this comes through okay. Mm -hmm. Clear. Good. Um, it's always interesting. Uh, I didn't have a prepared uh, uh, set of comments. Uh, I find it always interesting to listen to counsel and, um, and then comment on some of what the good words that they say. So uh, just to note, uh, I noted that during this uh, meeting, uh, there were approximately three people on, uh, on the Zoom here that are members of the public and about six on the usual broadcast. So uh, about a total of 10 people are watching uh, council, uh, which is um, disappointing in my point of view. Uh, but perhaps it's not uh, the cup of tea for the vast majority of people. On the uh, tax distribution uh, a workshop, which is um, uh, scheduled, I believe, for uh, April the 19th, that's the, where the apportionment of the taxes will be taking place. Um, the uh, statement was also made that on March the 29th, the council would adopt the plan, but I think that might be a uh, an error. I believe it's actually April the 12th when council will adopt it and the March 29th is for the first three readings. Now the deadline for the adoption of the financial plan is legally actually, I believe, May the 14th, well after the uh, the uh, portioning or tax distribution. And I've written to council about uh, trying to uh, synchronize those two um, for, from the public's point of view so that you didn't make a commitment on how you're going to uh, portion it on the understanding that right now it's going to be 3% for the residential, but you could change that with the uh, tax distribution. So again, I'm just saying there's flexibility in the timing and the deadlines. You only must adopt the financial plan before the tax distribution, but you can still have them synchronized and, and lots of public discussions on both of those. Um, the other point I want to make is that there is a, a increasing <coughs> aging population, or you might call it a bubble, uh, for seniors, uh, and uh, they're less likely uh, to partake in um, the kind of transportation systems um, uh, that you are planning to uh, increase, you know, the active transportation component. I believe that uh, you will see a, a drop in the per capita use um, uh, due to the aging population. But of course, uh, me being in, in that segment, welcome uh, that people will be uh, less on the road with their cars. It leaves me and others like me, which have to rely more on the cars, uh, more room on the road. Um, finally, um, on the usefulness of the search facility, and getting at information on the district's website. I've urged time and time again that you should look at Google. You have to pay them a little money, um, but the uh, Google search is marvelous for finding things. In fact, I find things using Google from the outside, uh, outside of the, uh, the web of uh, the district, uh, a better way of finding what the district has. 
so, so again, a point, a case point is that if you slightly make one slight spelling area, area in your search on, in the district, you will find absolutely nothing because that spelling error, it verbatim looks for that. Those words have to appear exactly spelled right. And that's a great impediment for people searching, especially nowadays when people don't know how to spell. So thank you very much for um, the uh, lively discussion and informative discussion you had. And uh, I welcome the, uh, the follow-up uh, council meetings and workshops that will take place as a consequence. Thank you, Dr. Koss. Appreciate it. Mr. Danilo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Little. Um, just to address one of the questions that uh, Dr. Koss uh, put out there, and that was on the adoption of the plan on April 12th uh, versus the 29th. Um, the original materials and the materials in the schedule, I believe, do uh, say adoption on April 12th. Um, and after reviewing where we are with our projects, there's a number of time sensitive projects. And uh, with uh, the new powers that the municipality has to do first three readings and adoption on the same night, um, we're suggesting that it's in our best interest to do three readings and adoption on the 29th to enable some time sensitive projects uh, to proceed uh, two weeks earlier uh, in the schedule. So just uh, pointing, pointing out why we're showing adoption on the 29th in the schedule tonight. Okay, well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> uh, may have to describe what uh, those time sensitive uh, projects are, but uh, um, I think uh, Dr. Koss also made the point of pointing out that there's been some compression in the schedule where uh, there wasn't uh, from the time of introduction to the time that the community association uh, group reviewed it to the time that we went to our public input night and to the time that we did our uh, 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 tonight's presentation is that there's been some compression over pre-COVID uh, kind, of, kind of schedules. But uh, uh, so, Again, uh, we want to make sure that people feel they've had a had a reasonable opportunity to uh, to participate in these processes. Uh, Cooper Quinn, got a few minutes to address council. Remember to unmute myself there. Um, thank you, Your Worship. So, speaking on behalf of the NSMBA here, and hopefully it'll just be. Me this time, I gotta try to keep my voice down here so I don't wake anyone up. Um, a big thanks to staff, uh, obviously for responding kindly to comments around the NSMBA mountain bike users that we saw in the public input there in the uh, addendum. And their hard work through these times is really appreciated both on this budget and everything else. And you know, with everything they've done with and without the NSMBA just across the board, it's been really hard on everyone, I'm sure. Cooper, um, Cooper just slow down a little bit. Talk quietly, but just slow down. <laughs> And not wake anyone up, but I, I get it. Yes, but you just have to. Fair enough. Um, so the NSMBA uh, appreciates that you know municipal budgets are immensely complex. Your job is very hard, and you have a lot of stakeholders and values to balance. And this is, you know, even more true as we hit what is basically the one-year anniversary of uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic here in BC. Um, what we've seen through 2020 and 2021, I think is how valuable outdoor spaces are for mental and physical health of our residents and our visitors. Um, and yeah, and SMBA would advocate for, I think budgeting and funding appropriate uh, to the levels of use that we're currently seeing for our parks, our open spaces and our trails um, so that our natural environment is maintained to the highest standards and our residents have places to, to recreate in a safe manner. Um, the NSMBA has done a huge amount of work with our partners in the Parks Department to get our trails up to sustainable standards, um, and we'd hope to keep them in good shape for the future. And I'd certainly echo Councillor Murray's comments that many of the new trail users we see out there are likely to continue to utilize these assets and we should plan accordingly. Uh, proactive management will be vital to maintain these areas. And as we've seen in the past, uh, reacting is much harder down the road there than proactive management. So. Things like the Seymour Trail Strategic Plan is a great step. 
Um, there's a lot of other additional areas in the district, I think, in need of planning. And, you know, the from management plan is perhaps uh, gaining on, it's a little long in the tooth and perhaps, I won't say out of date, but it's aging. Um, so as suggested by several councillors as well, we, the MSMBA would support increasing active transportation funding to help alleviate congestion woes, overworked trailheads, and you know, understandably frustrated neighbors in these neighborhood areas that uh, are seeing so much load right now. As Dr. Cost rightly points out, it's beneficial for those who drive um, as well as those who don't. And so in addition, um, you know, it'll help increase the health of our residents and our planet. And so there's so many transportation and demand management tools that may be effective and we can help ease some of these concerns, especially in the really jam-packed neighborhoods. Um, but we do need to ensure access is maintained, I think, for all users and all trail abilities, and especially those who may have a more difficult time moving about, you know, access for seniors and those with disabilities to their trailheads is uh, is very, very important. And so accommodating those needs you know, within those transportation demand management plans. Um, Almost done there to clarify a couple of points seen in the public input in the addendum, um, just for so everyone's on the same page. The NSMBA currently receives $100,000 per year from the DNV for trail maintenance on Frome. This is for trail work only. Uh, it does not cover administration costs on our end. It does not cover vehicles. Um, and we're in the process of working with staff to update this agreement on uh, on from for the next several years and we'll see then the outcomes of the uh, Seymour Trails plan. Um, and my apologies to the hiker that had a poor experience with mountain bikers. There's absolutely no excuse for this. And as Dr. Henry Hill tells us, please be kind out there. Um, so thanks again to staff and council. And as always, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself at the NSMB directly if there's any questions or uh, concerns or if you're just um, wondering why something happened out there. So thank you again and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you very much, uh, Cooper, and thank you also for participating in the uh, community level discussions about uh, mountain biking that have been taking place over the last little while. That's always appreciated. Okay. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I see no further speakers at this time. We do have a motion that's on the floor, and this was moved by Councillor Hansen, seconded by Councillor Back, and this was to receive this report for information. Uh, and I believe we've had a good discussion uh, tonight, Mr. Wardell. Yeah, through your worship, um, there is some work the staff need to do in order to bring this forward for March 29th. And uh, there is, uh, I'll say, direction to refer this to uh, a regular council for, sec for second and third reading plus adoption. And um, that would give us today direction to at least prepare the bylaws in advance of those meetings. Okay, yeah, I was just going from the recommendation in the report, which was that uh, the, the matter be received. You're looking for additional direction and referred back to regular, regular meeting of council. council. Uh, and what's the date for that next consideration? Or are you talking about the 29th meeting? I'm talking about the 29th meeting for second and third. If it doesn't make it through on the 29th, then we would have to move it to the following week. Uh, Councillor Hansen, is that a friendly? Yeah, happy to move that. Okay, and Councillor Back seconded, so we've just altered the wording of that. I uh, hope the clerks are all okay with that. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, and uh, so any other discussion on the motion? Okay, call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary-minded? Motion carries, and the matter is re uh, directed to our March 29th meeting of Council. And I would request, uh, Mr. Danilek, that if you are going to be uh, making a request for first, second, third, and adoption that uh, you sort of articulate the, the time sensitive nature of those pieces because uh, uh, we're using an emergency power for a reason that may not be actually an emergency. And so I'd, I'd just be uh, look forward to justification for that. Mr. Stewart, any closing comments? No, Your Worship. Uh, naturally, we'll take into account any of the comments Council has made tonight. And if there's appropriate adjustments that can or should be made, uh, we would. Uh, we would uh, bring those forward and we would make those known to council. Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. Thank you very much, council and members of the public for participating tonight. Uh, have yourselves a great evening. Good night.